Hello and welcome to South Carolina Farm Bureau's installment of Voices of Agriculture. I'm your host, Reggie Hall. During this installment, we'll take a barbecue tour across the state of South Carolina. Some say that South Carolina is the unofficial capital of barbecue in the country. We'll find out why. We'll also introduce you to our farmer outstanding in the field and come to the intersection of farm fresh food and fine restaurants across the state. All that and more coming up in just a moment on Voices of Agriculture, South Carolina installment. This is South Carolina Farm Bureau's installment of Voices of Agriculture. I'm your host, Reggie Hall. It's sweltering summertime heat in South Carolina, which means only one thing, and that is that people across the state are gearing up for vacation, family gathering, summertime holidays, festivals, and of course all that means barbecue. Of course, no large family gathering would be complete in the South without fresh fruits and vegetables and good slow-cooked barbecue. That was the case in Pendleton, South Carolina recently, where the Carters and two other families traditionally blend their culinary talents and skills to host several hundred of their closest relatives and other friends for a good old-fashioned summertime barbecue. We caught up with South Carolina Barbecue Association President Lake High to gain some insight into South Carolina's unique barbecue history, including the official definition of the word barbecue in South Carolina. Barbecue is a noun is specifically pork because that's what barbecue started as um, when the Indians and the Spanish got together in the 1500s and invented it and barbecue is pork so when we say barbecue in South Carolina we're talking pork. Barbecue is a long-running thread through the fabric in our southern culture and being and it's tied directly to our agrarian roots. You find your best barbecue I have discovered from either in the agricultural counties where the tradition still holds or the guy that's cooking it came off the farm. I mean, that's just the way it is. That's where the heritage was. That's where the experience, that's where the knowledge came from. That's where the roots are and thank goodness. According to High, barbecue is more than a thread in our fabric. It's a cornerstone in our historical foundation as a state dating back to the original colonies. South Carolina has two things that, well, three really, that makes it the capital. First, it was invented here by the Spanish and the Indians back in the 1500s when the first colony in the New World was in South Carolina, Santa Elena. It's not there anymore, but it was there, and it was there for a generation. And it was a big place, 500 people of 500 families. They had uh, a church, they had, uh, they had a blacksmith shop, they had a fort, they had they had everything they needed. They were there for a generation. Then they finally left and went to St. Augustine. Okay. It was invented there. Um, the second thing is, is we've got the variety. We've got the longest continuous history of it. I remember a guy from Florida, I was on the radio to him, and he said, well, Lake, how can you say it wasn't invented in Florida? I said, well, tell me, do you have a, an unbroken tradition of vinegar and pepper down there? And he said, no, actually, we don't. Uh, I said, well, it may have been invented. I doubt it. I said, but certainly it got lost in the meantime, whereas we have a continuous thing. Right. People will say, well, gee, the Spanish went away, but when the English came here in the 1600s, they were surprised, they were truly surprised, mm -hmm. to see all these Spanish uh, missions, just like in California, the, the, the religious, they left the priest here, and they left the missions here, and they were with the Indians and so forth. So we've got this unbroken tradition of it. The third thing is, is we have more barbecue contests in our town, our little towns, than any, per capita, per, for our population, than any state in the nation. More per capita. There are generally four types of barbecue sauces, each found in its own geographic pocket of the state. Heavy tomato is what Madison Avenue executives would have the rest of the world believe is the only type of barbecue sauce. Oddly enough, it's the hardest to find in any of the state's authentic barbecue huts. The oldest is vinegar and pepper, uh, which is primarily in the lower PD and in the PD area of this state. We have mustard sauce, 
which is an invention of our German heritage. And when you go to a barbecue place, I'll tell you, if you read the sign and it's got a German name on it, it's gonna be a mustard sauce inside. If it's Jackie Heights or Bessinger's or uh, Ziegler's or you name it, Price, you know, if it's, a, if it's a German name, there's a mustard sauce inside. Every time, every time, because uh, it's their heritage. And we've had that sauce in this state since 1730s. And then of course we have the PD sauce, which is a vinegar and pepper sauce, basically, with some tomato added in, a few spices, a little sweetness, that sort of thing. Historically, barbecue was cooked in a shallow open pit dug into the ground, filled with hardwood and covered to help retain the heat and infuse the meat with smoke. Now you'll find slow rotisserie cookers, the use of natural gas or propane, and pits raised off the ground to make for a more efficient process. Those of us who really know what barbecue is, and that's all, most people in South Carolina, um, they, don't, they didn't like that change and capitalism has stepped in and there are some people out there who said, I got an idea, why don't we just take the gas, put these big automatic things, put them on a nice rotisserie in there, put it in there, you can control the heat with the gas, but we'll put a wood box on it, we'll put real wood in there, real, and blow the smoke in there. And the truth is, is all of the, all of the smoke that the meat's gonna absorb, it's gonna absorb in about the first seven hours, or for that matter, the last seven hours. And so if you're doing whole hog, or anything, butts, whatever. So they can smoke this stuff, and I tell you, it is a rare bird today who can tell the difference between something cooked with a good smoke box and, good, and uh, a good one with some good wood in it and something that's been pit cooked. The average person, I don't think, can do it. So we're moving back to the old taste. Isn't that great? Speaking of gas pits, our first stop on this barbecue tour will be along Highway 52 in Kingstree, South Carolina, at Brown's Barbecue. Family farmer and now restaurant owner Tommy Brown has been cooking all his life. He began the restaurant when farm prices bottomed out around the mid-1980s. I always enjoyed cooking for the family and enjoyed doing it and it's something you got to, to really enjoy doing. My son does most of the cooking, a lot of the cooking and seeing after the cooking and everything now, him and his wife Angie. They hold a number of national and regional cooking contest awards and cater to places as far away as the nation's capital. People driving through the I-95 corridor often take a detour to stop by and eat their fill from the famous Brown's Barbecue Buffet, which includes pulled pork drenched from homemade vinegar sauce. It's a vinegar base with uh, peppers and different seasonings in the sauce that I make. And uh, it's, uh, uh, we call it full hand, um, pool barbecue. It's, 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 we doesn't cut it very little by hand. We do it all by hand, no, no uh, mechanical cutting of the barbecue. Brown's Buffet has been described as a barbecue bonanza of slow cooked pork and a host of classic sides, such as milky macaroni and cheese, chicken pot pie, and best ever collards. The gas pits means no one has to stay with the meat all night like they did in the old days. With gas pits, the temperature can be set at the end of the day and then left overnight to cook without supervision. One patron said of Brown's Barbecue, can't say enough about the food or the hospitality. Best barbecue I have ever eaten. This is a family business and their pride in what they do shines as bright as the sun. When we come back, we'll venture to Lexington County, South Carolina to visit Heights Barbecue, where the sauce is rich and deep yellow in color. All that and more coming up in just a moment as Voices of Agriculture, South Carolina Farm Bureau edition continues.
Welcome back. Our barbecue tour of South Carolina continues as we go to a fairly newly hyphenated town called Batesburg Leesville, South Carolina. That's a town about halfway between South Carolina's capital city of Columbia and Augusta, Georgia. Now many of you may think of Batesburg Leesville and think immediately of Sheely's Barbecue and it's no wonder because they have grown so over the years because of their catering and because of their extensive barbecue buffet. But just around the corner from Sheely's on Church Street in Batesburg Leesville is Heights Barbecue. It's been going for decades now and we stopped in to visit with Jackie Height to find out more about his mustard base South Carolina barbecue. Anybody just can't cook hogwood wood, you got to know, because if they ain't dripping and smoking, they ain't cooking. I'll tell you that right now. Jackie Height produces barbecue the old-fashioned way. He burns real wood, stokes his own pits, and follows a time-honored method taught to him by his dad and other former masters of the craft. Some say while his smoky mustard-based hogs boggle the mind, the pork skins will make you slap yourself. Height learned his trade by growing up around it, and as we've said, barbecue in the South is a cultural practice, one that requires years of a good mentor. My daddy started us when we were little boys, about nine, ten years old, sitting up at night watching the fire while he'd go lay down and take a little nap with the fire departments. And then finally, as we got on up 12, 14 years old, we opened a little barbecue place up uptown about two or three blocks from here on my granddaddy's old mule stable lot, we call it, because he was a veterinarian years ago. While the thick white smoke from the wood-stoked barbecue pits may be considered by some as a nuisance, Jackie Height says through the years it's actually helped build commerce and tourism for the town. That's what I'm doing now, because I got people who write letters to the editor telling me my barbecue helps this town smell so good when they ride through here on Friday morning, that odor, rumor, whatever it is, just tear them up. They can't help but stop and come back by and get some barbecue that day. <laughs> Heights is also famous for their collard greens. We cook collards on Sunday for people, and I have ladies tell me they can't even cook collards at home, but it tastes good as mine. I know why they told me that, too, because they don't want to stink the house up. <laughs> even though Heights is located smack dab in the middle of mustard sauce country, Mr. Jackie has learned through the years to be accommodating, so they offer patrons other sauces upon request. When we come back, we'll go to Buffalo, South Carolina, where barbecue takes on a whole different meaning, and they sprinkle sawdust on the floor. All that and more when we continue on South Carolina Farm Bureau's installment of Voices of Agriculture. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back. We've saved the oldest of our stops for last as we head north from Lexington County and west on I-26 to Union County and Buffalo, South Carolina. Buffalo is about a mile from the town of Union, where we go to Midway Barbecue. It's a meat market and barbecue establishment. We were there about 9 o'clock in the morning and witnessed a steady flow of traffic from then until we left at lunchtime. Midway Barbecue was started by Jack O'Dell back in the 1940s. Described as a cattleman with the heart of a cowboy, Jack ran a meat market and sold pit-cooked barbecue in the small little store on Main Street in Buffalo, South Carolina, a location that's expanded a dozen or more times in the last 70 years. And while Jack still supervises from a distance and keeps a close eye on his recipes, the day-to-day -day operation is run by son-in-law Jay Allen. The one thing I can say about him, he had the best taste buds of anybody I could ever imagine. He knew when something wasn't right or, or if it was missing a little something. And, and he took tons of time and tons of pains to savor the flavor. Where, you know, you get in a hurry and the hustle and the bustle to get it done, get it done. He never did that. He, he always stopped and he tasted his hash and he tasted it and he'd say, need a little more pepper, need a little more salt, every pot. The finishing sauce used at Midway is a light tomato sauce with a vinegar pepper base. The pork is slow cooked each night and smoked with hickory wood before it's pulled off the bone, hand separated and chopped. And as good as Midway's barbecue is, dark, rich, golden brown dripping with succulent juices from the finest cuts of the hog, their hash is even better. Unlike any I've ever had, it's not liver hash that's made and served at barbecue houses south of here. Instead, it's a very tasty beef hash with identifiable ingredients. We take front quarter, 
because we do local beef, right. and we take that whole front quarter and put it in our hash pot. However, you know, like if you were going to make it at home, we yeah. suggest chuck roast. Okay. It's got a little bit of fat, a little bit of bone, right. and then uh, we take butter, onion, salt, and pepper, and it's ropey and rich and uh, to die for. The restaurant is also known for its chicken stew. Picture a milk-based oyster stew with chicken instead of oysters. We call it Union County Penicillin. Midway buys all its pork and beef from local producers before they age and butcher it on site. So we hang our beef in here several weeks, get it aged to perfection. So it been doing it that way 30, 40, 50 years. It's the last aging cooler that I know of. Midway Barbecue uses farm fresh ingredients when in season, cooked on site every day by a pair of women who come in between two and three in the morning to get the day's side item menu on the stove. And we have uh, several people that come in two o'clock in the morning and everybody has a job and we have, we, we call it the Midway Brain. We have a board and it, it, it's orders, specific orders and everybody just drives, that, that board drives us and everybody has a job and everybody does it. And uh, we have very little turnover. Uh, we've had people been here 15, 20 years, had one lady been here over 50 years. So uh, we, don't, we have very little turnover. And then a lot of it's family. At any one time, you might be six, out of 20 people, six or seven of them be family members. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. And as if the history of the place, the unique menu, and the hospitality of the Midway staff would be enough to motivate your visit here, the restaurant hasn't changed its prices in three years. We think it's the best food you can get anywhere, regardless of the price, but we, we try hard to keep our price down. And like I said, we hadn't had a price increase in three years. Uh, meat and three vegetables, tea and dessert, $6. Meat and three vegetables, two pieces of bread, fat back, onion, $5. That's tax included, and, that, and we don't allow a tip. Have a lot of people, we actually take a debit card and credit card, because that's what everybody's doing now, but we, we do no tip. And a lot of people out of town want to leave a tip, and we don't need, you know, say, I'm sorry, we don't take it. And they look at you funny, but they, they, they appreciate it. I and you see those people come back, too. Don't I guarantee you. <laughs> I guarantee you. That's so right. we, we take pride in doing it right. And sure. Jack loves to see people eat, and he loves to see people enjoy his food. Oh, and what about the sawdust on the floor? Years and years ago, every meat market had sawdust. So, uh, and I told you, my father and all, he loved it. He was a meat man. That's what he took pride in, that's what he loved. And when he bought this place, I mean, I mean that's the, that was the way. Yeah. So now we keep it up for, for the look, and we love it too. Yeah. For uh, people come in, you spill a drink, or you, we rake it, we rake, we rake the sawdust, clean it up, yeah. and ready to go. It should be noted that each of these restaurants takes great pride in serving locally grown food and produce from local farmers in their areas. Of course, there are hundreds of other great barbecue establishments across South Carolina, and we invite you to visit any of those as you travel to or through the Palmetto State. Each of these we thought was unique in some form or fashion with their menu, their cooking style, or of course how they define barbecue in South Carolina. People start when their kids eating it, they eat it at the church functions, they eat it at uh, the, the local civitans or the ruritans, they'll cook it up and serve it at the football games, it becomes part of the wharf and woof of your life. And it just becomes a part of you. I, the, my first barbecue memory with my two uncles digging a pit out behind the house, Granny's house down on the farm, and going into the barn and getting these big iron bars and throwing them across the pit and putting the coals down there and killing the hog and cleaning him, I want you to know. And I got to watch all of this. That's fascinating when you're a little boy. And putting him on that pit and swabbing him with a, a broomstick that's got, got cloth on it and a big bucket. I mean, this, this is romance. I mean, this is romance, you know? Oh, I, I remember it to this day. Yeah. You know, absolutely, sure. <laughs>
I'm the third generation of this farm. Um, I was raised on a farm and I went to Clemson and uh, then I came back after I finished school and, and started farming my parents. And then I increased the operation to right at 1100 acres now because my sons came in and started farming with me. I kicked the 81 yard against Texas A&M at home and I broke the uh, record that was held before then and it hadn't been broken yet. Back in the mid 80s, we, we started looking for something to do as far as diversification also, and started a barbecue sauce and had it in two or three uh, grocery stores. And it was getting to a point where you either had to, um, either had to make a lot at one time and have it at the distribution center where they could get it to the stores. And it just would take uh, for quite a few years to get your money back on the investment. And we kind of decided not to kind of pull away from that and just um, make it for family mostly. I've been with Farm Bureau ever since I started farming. I'm a state uh, chairman of the Poultry Committee for uh, Farm Bureau in South Carolina. It's a grassroots organization and that's, that's what we need in the farming uh, industry and I think we have a good um, Farm Bureau organization in the state of South Carolina. Join us this summer as South Carolina's top farmers team up with some of South Carolina's top chefs for Farm Bureau's fourth annual summer celebration of locally grown and prepared food. Farm Bureau's Palmetto Palette will be held on Thursday evening, July 22nd from 6 until 9 at the historic 701 Whaley Street building in the Olympia community of Columbia, South Carolina. Your $50 per person ticket will enable you to taste all you'd like of South Carolina farm fresh delicacies from a dozen or more chefs and drink wine specifically paired for each dish. Local farmers will provide each chef with the ingredients they'll need to complete their Palmetto Palette menus. It's one of the purest Taste of South Carolina events featuring chefs from South Carolina's leading restaurants who already participate in the state's Fresh on the Menu Certified South Carolina Grown program. Many chefs who participated in the 2009 event will return along with some new entries. Palmetto Palette will also feature a silent auction of rural cultural items. If you plan to be in South Carolina July 22nd, make plans now to help us celebrate Farm Bureau's Palmetto Palette and all that's good about family farmers. Purchase your tickets today by calling 803-936-4219. That's 803-936-4219. Tickets are $50 per person for all you can eat and drink the evening of July 22nd. Call 803-936-4219 today. Visa and MasterCard are accepted. Satisfy your tastes for good food at Farm Bureau's Palmetto Palette. As we near the close of our program, we've turned one of our regular features, Palmetto Portraits, into a patriotic tribute of family farmers and locally grown food. Well, that's all the time we have for South Carolina Farm Bureau's installment of Voices of Agriculture. We hope you enjoyed our barbecue tour across South Carolina and enjoyed meeting our farmer outstanding in the field as well as our patriotic tribute to family farmers in South Carolina and domestically produced food. If you're interested in these topics or more, please log on to our website at any time, scfb.org. Until next time, I'm your host, Reggie Hall. Thanks for watching. <music>